once again and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and this is our last show in the studio for the season. Next week we will be at the fair. Our season finale will be in the Backyard Farmer Garden. There is still time for you to phone in those questions. Give us a call at 1-800-676-5446. We will still take your emails and your pictures for future shows. That address is byf at unl.edu. Of course, tell us where you live. Give us as much information as you can about your issue. Do not forget to follow us during the week on our social media pages, YouTube, Facebook. So, Wayne, you have something <coughs> edible and you have something that's been eating it. I wouldn't guarantee this is edible. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it, maybe. Well, maybe, well, this is my son's <laughs> crossbred pumpkin. Uh, so it was a volunteer that he decided he wanted to grow. and. Well, he met into some unfortunate setbacks with it. Uh, as you can see on the end of here, uh, the stem of this, there's some frass from squash vine borer larvae. They've been tunneling through the vine. They moved into the stem. And then also you can see the holes here in the side of it where they've tunneled into the fruit. Uh, Best time to control these is actually when the adults are flying, which is now about a month past. And uh, you're left with about one other solution. If you do see damage, which is the frass coming out of the vine. So here's a leaf stem. This is kind of my little trap crop. I caught a bunch out of the vine. Uh, I caught six more out of there today. It's 20 out of one vine, but you split it open and then you find larvae inside. Now they typically don't go up into the leaf stalks like this. They had no other choice because of what I gave them. And oops, turn it for the camera here. There we oh go. My goodness. You can see them in there. And, yeah. And what you do is you can split them out of the vine and then you can bury that vine and hope that vine does reroot. Mm -hmm. And First session, we've my son buried that vine, and he was successful in keeping that part of the vine alive. Well, now I buried the other side of the vine for him this afternoon after I dug these out. So uh, that's about what you can do at this point. Cut down the population for next year. All right, thank you, Wayne. That's gross. That's beautiful. <laughs> that was great. Yeah, and you think that's beautiful this too. Is beautiful and most too. of our viewers would yes. not agree with you, well, these Lauren. These are pretty. I have some pretty flowers too. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So actually, as I was uh, picking these today, I thought I I think the last time I was on, I brought on powdery mildew of lilac, mm -hmm. and powdery mildew is so prolific in my yard this year, it's on everything. So I thought I would share this. So this is on a zucchini plant. And you can just see that dusty appearance. I'm sure any of you that have a backyard garden, if you're not managing this by this time of the year, you should start to see it. Uh, you'll see just that powdery appearance. Uh, and then those leaves will typically kind of burn and, and go. There's nothing on the underside, usually just on the upper side. Uh, and then the other one that I have is on the Xenia. And same thing, just this light, whoops, had the leaf picked out here. Just a real light powdery appearance on the zinnia leaf too. I don't know if we can see that, but it really looks the same, just like we, we would show uh, on the lilacs. So you can just kind of see that little dusty off color. And, and the reason I'm bringing this on today is that it's at this point, you're not really gonna try to manage this disease, uh, but it's really important to try to manage your residue. So after garden season, making sure that you're cleaning up uh, because this fungus will many times uh, survive on residue. So remove that residue, uh, do that garden cleanup, and hopefully you'll be in better shape next year. All right, excellent. Thank you, Lauren. Mm -hmm. Jeff, it's beautiful and big. <laughs> well, I thought I'd bring in, um, so these are three different hydrangeas, and I thought kind of the, the summer of hydrangea. Mm -hmm. And it seems like right now, um, there are so many hydrangea choices uh, many that I obviously don't have here since I just have the three. There's a lot of choices out here, but I wanted to talk about them kind of through the season. So the first one, the one with the the uh, flower head that is is past its prime, is an oak leaf hydrangea. And so that's something that's going to flower late spring, early summer. Um, and it's also one that we want to avoid pruning um, at this time of year. We're probably getting to that point where it's a little too late to do that because it it flowers on the old wood. So uh, if you prune it hard in the spring, you're gonna wonder why every year it never flowers for you. 
So, and you'll be disappointed. So that's that's one. Sometimes can be a little tricky. And in, in, of the three of them, I thought was kind of interesting. One thing that I've been monitoring a lot on campus is um, Japanese beetle choices. And of the hydrangeas, it seems to pick oak leaf hydrangea, but not the others that I've seen so far. Wow. Which is just kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. This one here is a arborescens or Annabelle hydrangea. Uh, and it flowers a little later in the summer, kind of midsummer. Um, the oak leaf can tolerate um, a little bit more sun. Uh, this Annabelle is one that I would say you'd want to keep out of the late day sun, certainly. Um, but again, it kind of provides some bright white color when it's in flower in, in areas that can be a little shady, so it kind of lightens that up. And then the last one is a panicle, or this one is limelight uh, hydrangea. And this one gets some late day sun, um, and it seems to do pretty well. It uh, tolerates that. It's on the north side of a building, but it's, um, it does get kind of the west sun. So it's out of maybe real intense sun, but it does get some bright light in the day. So it does well. And that one is spectacular. And that's one, so that the arborescence and the panicle, we cut back harder mm -hmm. in the spring, mm -hmm. so. There you go, thank you, Jeff. All right, Wayne, you get the first round of pictures. Uh, the first one here comes to us from Glenwood, Iowa. You have two pictures of it. These grapes are only in their second year. They're a green variety. The vines are turning yellow. Obviously, we have some insect damage on there. They don't know what to do about it, whether it's a borer or environmental. What do we think on this one? Well, as you stated, the leaf is definitely Japanese beetle damage. It's very characteristic with the lacing. Uh, as far as I'm aware, you would, there's no insect that would cause yellowing of the vine without having other issues on the leaves. Mm -hmm. If you had a borer, you would expect to see some wilting, some other problems with the leaves. So I don't know if this is going to be one of those things where it's a management, environmental, so that would be something for Jeff or Lauren to chime in on. Mm -hmm if they have anything. I'm hearing radio silence yeah, well, here. <laughs> you know, inconsistent watering is kind of, uh, so whether it's yeah. too dry or too wet can cause this in a lot of plants and, yeah. and in grapevine as well. So that's, that would be one of those things. And kind of the, the weather we've had this year has been, you know, heavy drenching rains followed by a period of long, right. uh, a dry period. So if we're not following up and maintaining uh, even moisture after that, you may end up with something like this. All right, yeah. Yeah, the crew was pointing out here, I'm, I think I'm supposed to talk about this leaf more. You can see that lacing right. uh, where it leaves the veins. That's very characteristic of Japanese beetle feeding. Right, all right, so your next picture is also a grape, uh, picking Japanese beetles off them. And this is in Broken Bow, came across these two larger ones. Are they good guys or bad guys? If it's good, it's too late because they already had a soap bath but he does want to know what they are. They're a grapevine beetle, and they're a native. They're not an exotic, but they can cause some damage on your grapevines if left alone. So don't leave so them alone. I think how they took care of them was very appropriate. Bucket of soapy water works well for that. All right, and since we're on the Japanese beetle run here, this is two pictures of raspberries in Bellevue. Uh, they have developed a taste for his red raspberries. He's wondering whether there's a risk to the family from eating the fruit the beetles have munched on or left their, their beetle frass on. Well, anytime you eat fresh fruit, you take the risk of ingesting various insect parts and pieces and their excrement. So keep that in mind. That's why we wash fruit before we eat it. Also, that is damaged fruit. I'm not confident that I would be able to get everything out of that damaged portion of the fruit after that by washing. So I wouldn't eat it <laughs> in, in my book. I'd let it go to the compost or trash pile. All right, thank you, Wayne. You get a, get a lot of fungal infections a lot of times with damaged fruit too, so just wanna be careful there too. Perfect, all right. Uh, since you love trees, always long. Get out the chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> this is a viewer from Waterloo. Uh, she has a big pine close to her house, does have dying needles and branches. 
Um, she's wondering what to do. I think we have two pictures mm -hmm. on this one. Can you tell yeah, this, really what's this going is, on? Uh, this picture is actually really important. So you can see the roof there. Mm -hmm. and, and I really feel looking at this that this is related to some of that high temperature maybe that those branches are exposed to over that, um, you know, that asphalt surface with a shingle roof. Mm -hmm. uh, that can get really hot. And there's really no reason for that distribution otherwise, Kim, when you look at it. So I, I think in that particular case, I think you've got some injury there from just high temperatures, particularly when you get a 100 degree day, you know, that roof temperature might be, I bet it's over 140 degrees. I, I don't know, it might be way up there. I don't know exactly, but mm -hmm. um, I can tell some stories about how I know how hot it can be. But anyway, uh, but I, I feel like that's probably just injury from the roof and they're just gonna wanna do some pruning to remove that so that they've got some, some distance. All right, thank mm -hmm. you, Lauren. Your next two are uh, Baccarat Blue Spruce. The top half is mm -hmm. turning light green. Uh, this is Eagle, Nebraska. I'm really sorry to our viewers in Eagle. I mean, this is to me a beautiful thing, but it's not beautiful for you. So when you see that whole section of a tree uh, that's turning like that, that's some sort of canker that's mm -hmm. impacting that. And you may not be visible. I think they said they couldn't see anything, but right. look closely and there may be a little bit of <clears throat> sap coming out of the stem near, you know, about a six inch zone where that's changed in color, uh, maybe a little swollen, something's going on there that there should be some injury, some sort of canker to kill the, the that terminal portion of the tree. How do they manage that or other than starting? Well, the, the best thing in this case, I mean, it's, it's gonna, you're gonna have to top it if you feel you could retrain a leader and possibly get it up there, uh, but you're killing half of the tree at this point, mm -hmm. so they may wanna replace. Oh, I just, you know, I, I would recommend cutting it off and you, you could let it go and see what happens. I mean, what's the one that's the big round ball one? A big round ball one. That maybe it a looks globe. like that. You've got a, a globe. globe. You've yeah. got a globe spruce instead of one that's upright. Plant an upright one by it and that might look nice. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Best you can do. You're a pathologist. Stay away yeah. from design. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jeff, it's also tree world for you tonight. Okay. Uh, the first one here, this is in Brainerd. And three pictures on this, uh, wondering what happened, it's a maple, what has happened to the trunk. So we got this going on. I think we have a third picture on this one. And they're wondering, of course, will this tree survive? Um, you know, it looks like there's a few things going on. That it, if anything, it kind of looks like maybe it was struck or maybe animal damage at some point. It, the way there's some flat portions on the trunk tells me there may be some root damage as well. Um, so there's a few things going on with this. You know, obviously it has a big crown, it's full of leaves, so it's still um, still doing its thing. You know, the, the way to avoid some of this is uh, to have that area mulched and protecting mm -hmm. the tree and also protecting those roots over time. So um, I would say if come spring, if you see some dieback in the tree, then I think I would look at replacing it. And then again, protecting the new tree with a mulch ring that's you know, several feet out, so that way we don't have to worry about anybody accidentally bumping into it or anything damaging the roads. All right, uh, your next two pictures come to us from Bellevue. Uh, this is the walnut. It is mm -hmm. 80 plus years old, mm, and the yeah. second picture is what it is doing, which is sloughing its bark with this giant trunk wound. Yeah. She wants to save it. What are we gonna save? Yeah, I don't think there's any saving that. As, as close as that is to a home, I don't yeah. think I would. If it was, a distance away that if some, if it failed, you didn't have to worry about it damaging property or or people, then um, then I would say just kind of keep an eye on it. But that's that's a major wound. I would have a professional arborist come out and take a look at that tree and make sure that you, you're not living under something that's a serious hazard. That doesn't look good. All right, so again, this is an instance where getting it out of the way quickly is yeah, a really good idea. Yeah, I think so. Idea. Like I said, they need to get someone in to review that tree. So. Right, all right. Well, you know, it has been a really long, hot summer. You might have a few thin spots in your lawn because of those harsh conditions. Matt Soshik will give us some good overseeding advice and fall lawn preparation tips for our first feature tonight. So today I'm going to look at maybe a few of these turf stands that we have here and try and explain, you know, whether we should or shouldn't seed. If you do have a thick stand and it's thinned down um, and it's not quite dead, you're looking at some of that green tissue 
Uh, you might be able to save that without overseeding. All you're gonna need is a little bit more water and fertilization to bring that turf and thicken it up. Especially if it's a bluegrass stand, it will spread by rhizomes and spread out and fill in. Tall fescue, on the other hand, it's more of an erect growth with short rhizomes, some of the newer varieties have, and it won't spread as big. So if you have patches, then it's probably gonna be time to overseed. So when it comes to overseeding, the main thing is to get good seed to soil contact. Uh, and what we have here is a few different machines, an aerifier, a uh, power rake, and just a uh, plain old rake. So if you don't have the fancy equipment or don't want to rent it, you can do it with a simple rake, just scratching the ground and making sure you get some of that, that fluff mixed up and that soil uh, scratched up so that the seed is able to get into that top quarter inch of soil. And that's going to be your best bet uh, to get a, get a fall establishment going. Um, on the other hand, looking at you know, what type of seed to use, if you do have a Kentucky bluegrass lawn or a tall fescue lawn, you kind of want to match it. If you have a mix, then go with a mix of both again and you'll be good to go and try and have your lawn uh, similar to what it's been in the past. All right, so when, when is the best time that you can start seeding? Right now is actually the ideal time to start seeding cool season turf. Uh, so from here on all the way to almost the end of October would be pushing it. So try and get it done before that, let's say first, second week of October, depending on the winter we have or the fall we have, you could get that grass up and seeded before we get into the too cold of temperatures where it's gonna stop growth. Uh, so another thing that you wanna look at when you're doing a seeding is fertilization. Uh, 11520 or 18460 is a standard phosphorus fer fertilizer. And those are the two that we generally use when we're seeding any type of turf. So the second number is the phosphorus. So we wanna make sure that we get some of that on, maybe one pound per thousand feet. And that helps that new turf stand uh, get the root growth in the ground and we're able to accelerate its growth. Um, so another thing that we're doing in the fall is aerification. So just because we aerify our lawn doesn't necessarily mean we need to overseed. If we have a thick, healthy lawn, if we're gonna overseed, we're probably not gonna get any of that seed to germinate because it's gonna to be too much competition from the turf that's there. So if you have a thin area, seed those areas, no need to do the whole lawn. Just make sure that you're getting that seed to soil contact. And with a lot of these air fires that you can rent, the spacing is probably four to five inches. So you're gonna to wanna to go over it four to five times to punch as many holes as you can, lightly rake that or power rake it to beat up that soil that you, that you air fried out and that will help establish that turf. So it is time to get out, inspect that turf, decide if you need to do some overseeding in those thin areas. Also do that aeration now, even if you're not going to put that seed down. Yes. Jens, Wayne, and your first one here is from Ashland. Plum trees are becoming devoured. What is eating the leaves on these? Is it harmful? Is there anything sh they should be doing about it now? Well, it would be helpful to have a specimen to know exactly. Mm -hmm. There's some speculation that comes with this. It could be one of three things. There's three things that'll cause this type of damage on a plum tree like this. Ash gray leaf beetle, plump pear slug, and our favorite of tonight, Japanese beetle. Yep. Uh, all of them can cause some damage on there. The ash gray leaf beetle and the pear slug are native. So just as an idea, that's what it could be. Not much to do right now. All right, so your next one here is two pictures of an oak in Omaha. It's 10 years old. It's had these curled leaves, which we've had all season. New ones do not curl. Uh, they thought they had looked for aphids or insect damage. They don't see any. Any advice on this? Well, they may not be there now. There's mm -hmm. a couple insects that it could have been that caused that. Aphids or lace bugs can cause that. And then there's some other things that Jeff probably would rather touch on than the entomologist in terms of what it, it may would do be, that. I mean, I, I think it's probably aphids or, I, my guess is probably aphids. Lace bugs is probably too early in the season for those. I doubt if it's chemical. I saw it in a lot of locations too, and it didn't associate itself with any sort of herbicide spraying that was going on. So I'm, I'm guessing you're right, it's probably the aphids. All right, and your final one uh, is from Wahoo. And it is, uh, please tell me what causes this. The tomatoes are just rotting on the vine. She uses drip water. Well, <laughs> the big clue here is the big hole, not from them cutting it open, but the big hole on the side uh, going straight in. 
and then all that feeding gunk and secondary infection that Lauren would just love uh, going on in there. That's tomato fruit worm. It's also known as corn earworm or the cotton bowl worm. They're all one in the same insect and they love tomatoes like this. Uh, you can try to protect your green ones yet with you know, either permethrin or carbaryl. Just make sure you pay really close attention to those pre-harvest intervals on those products if you do use them. All right, thank you, Wayne. All right, uh, more trees. This is an American elm in Seward, Lauren. Uh, it's been dropping leaves the last couple of weeks. See no sign of insects. We have, I think, a picture of the tree mm -hmm. and then a picture of the foliage itself. Any idea or anything they can spray it with? Well, I, I really wouldn't recommend spraying this. You have a large established tree that uh, it looks like there may be uh, some fungal leaf spot going on there. Mm -hmm. Septoria can infect. I'm not sure that's what it is. Uh, but I wouldn't recommend any application. It's not going to kill the tree by any means. All right. And your, your final two pictures on this round are from Sutton. This is a sweet gum. It's about five years old, showing this sort of issue. Uh, I think, again, we have two pictures of this one. Yeah, and, and, and these are always difficult when you have um, a tree where you've got some leaves falling off. I mean, this could actually be some of the stress that even Jeff mentioned earlier with uneven watering, high temperatures. Um, I didn't see anything on this that would suggest a disease if the whole tree does it or if you see some significant color changes in part of the tree that could suggest a canker as we get later in the season. All right, thank you, Lauren. You have three pictures on this first one, Jeff, from Brule. It's a golden rain tree that was damaged by a mesocyclone. Mm. Uh, scarred up branches, didn't leaf very well, but they do have some shoots from the base. Are we gonna recommend cutting it down, keeping it? I would recommend replacing it at this stage. I think it's suffered enough. So, <laughs> unfortunately, right. it's no one's fault, but I think it's probably, let's put it out of its misery. All right. Your next one also has three pictures. Uh, this is actually, uh, got hit by lightning on mm. July 9th and they thought it was the only damage but then they noticed the marks on the side of the tree and then these burn marks dry to the touch. Do they need to worry about the integrity of this tree? That's something I would be watching. So I've seen lightning strikes on campus. It sometimes takes a while for them to really exhibit the, and you'll start, I would guess, seeing some bark sloughing coming mm. this winter into next spring. So. Keep an eye on it, see, sometimes they'll recover, but I would keep an eye on watch for any bark starting to come off the tree and then I would have it removed. All right, and your final one is a simple cool ID. This uh, popped up among other plants in Shenandoah, Iowa. So that's a lobelia, so a blue cardinal flower. Uh, it's a native to Missouri, so it's a native plant. Um, so it's not highly unusual, but they, they do um, limitedly kind of seed themselves, so. All right, great blue lobelia. Yeah. Excellent, thanks, Jeff. Well, once more, it's time to hear from Terry from the Backyard Farmer Garden. Our show might be winding down for the season, but the garden is still going strong. Here's Terry to tell us more. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're continually harvesting from our produce and collecting produce from the community. We're up well over 650 pounds total between the two. Tuesday night we had 102 pounds of produce donated to the Backyard Farmer Garden that's going to make its way to East Campus food pantries. So thank you very much to everybody. As we're winding down our season, we're not winding down our garden. Our garden still looks fantastic. Our garden is open 24-7, so you are always welcome to come visit and see what is blooming on the fall end of the season. We have some great color and a lot of our coleus. We have some fantastic zinnias that are really just really popping and really blending in a lot of those colors. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. Right now, speaking of lightning, let's go with it. Okay. Right? Okay. This is a Lincoln viewer, could be a million of them. There is flagging in the oaks, especially the pin oaks. Is it the weather and is it the death knell? I don't think it's the death knell. There's a twig girdler a lot of times we'll see this time of year and we'll see that kind of spotty through the, so don't worry about it. All right, this is a Martinsburg viewer who wants to know when to transplant rhubarb, coneflowers, ferns, and hackberries. All of them. Mm -hmm. um, well, 
you know, I guess you could do, you could really do anything now. You can start this time of year, and as long as you're keeping up with your watering, put it in good soil, take care of it, you'll be fine. All right, this viewer uh, cut down a crab apple last year and the sprouts are coming up all over where the original tree was removed. How do you control it? Be short of mowing. Short of mowing, that's about all you can do. All right. I mean, it'll eventually wear itself out in 10 years or so. <laughs> okay, this is a Hildreth viewer who wants to know how much watering of new plants is too much watering? Well, if it's sitting in saturated soil, that's too much. If it can't dry out in a day's time, then that's too much. So you want it to be wet, but then have good drainage. All right, excellent, nice job. You are not winning this. <laughs> okay, this is a... Now wait a minute, you always ask me if I'm ready. <laughs> well, I'm not gonna ask you if you're ready, because clearly gonna, I got you are. one prepared tonight. I'm gonna, I'm still in a song. All right, are you ready? Gonna, yeah, I am, I'm gonna still line out of a country song, and I'm ready like truck stop ice tonight. <laughs> 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 On that note, this is a Scott's Bluff viewer who wonders about a canker on cottonwood, something they haven't seen before, and what is that, and can it be controlled? Mm, I, I wouldn't worry too much about that. If it is a canker, I would cut it out three to four inches below the affected area. Okay. This is a viewer who says their lawn turned orange and there is orange dust under the mower. Is that a fungus of some sort? Well, unless their mower's been sitting in water, I'm gonna guess that's a rust in the yard. So uh, at this point in the year, um, you're getting close to where you can start fertilizing and probably get yourself out of it without a fungicide application. All I'd right. wait a couple weeks. This is a viewer from Greenwood who apparently saw your growing of corn smut <laughs> video and they're wondering if they grow it on purpose one year, will it always be in their corn patch after that? It, it will always be there, uh, but again, there are hybrids you could select that are not as susceptible, and if you have really good pollination, that will also help where you won't have as much. All right, this viewer wants, from Ogallala wants to know if there's a rotten potato in the bottom of the bag, can it go in the compost or will it spread into the soil? So, so composting is, is a little tricky. So I'd like to say yes, but you have to compost it correctly. So if you just throw all your compost on a pile and it doesn't get to a high temperature, you could carry diseases through your compost pile. Excellent, nice job. Yeah. And as far as corn smut, I really don't understand why you wouldn't want it always to be there. <laughs> <laughs> it's great, you should try eating it. <laughs> All right, okay. Wayne, this is a viewer from, also from Lincoln, who said, is the flagging in oaks, the cicadas laying their eggs on the twigs? Highly unlikely. All right, we have a Greeley, Colorado viewer who heard us talk about trap crops for Japanese beetles. She's saying morning glories work. Have you seen that happen here? I haven't seen much for morning glories. Those bags with the pheromones placed away from everything you want to save. Way away, right. All right, this is a viewer out at Jeffrey Lake in central Nebraska, has found tiny black insects all over the top leaves of Maximilian sunflower. Tiny black insects? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a few small beetles that'll get in there, uh, feed on the pollen, it might be what they're seeing. Also, there's a lot of very small solitary bees that could be black that they might be seeing. All right, um, we have a Fremont viewer who says there are lightning bugs all over all the flowering plants. Isn't it too late for lightning well, it's bugs? probably not lightning bugs. It's something very closely related called soldier beetles. And this time of year we get the Pennsylvania leather wing. All right, uh, we have a viewer who sent in a picture actually and then a question about little yellow to white insects on the flower of blue stem. Are they insects? I'm guessing that might actually be the pollen mm -hmm. on, the, on there instead of an insect. All right, and you would be right. All right, thank you very much. Look at there, bugs won, as <laughs> <Nice> always. Job, <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jeff, what do we have for Plants of the Week? Well, you brought in some lovely annuals. So this, and you know, which is great about annuals, this time of year, they really are doing their thing. Yeah. I mean, they're, we're peaking here till, you know, late September if the weather holds. So mm -hmm. the, the small little buttons with the pink and the magenta, and I guess there's white on this side, are gumfrina. So they like a lot of sun, they like a little dry, uh, there's a big color range as you can see here, so it's a fun plant to have. And again, we were talking about watering during the lightning round. This is one you'd want to water, but make sure it isn't saturated, that you're not leaving it standing in water. Mm -hmm. And really the same thing for the coleus. 
Um, and the reason Kim brought this in tonight was to talk about how many times folks will pinch the flowers to continue to get the foliage to grow. And you can see how really the flowers are, are lovely and they're a major pollinator. She had to fight off the bumblebees tonight. We're lucky she's here with us. So, so they love, so the bees love this. So if you're looking for another pollinator in your garden, the coleus might be a good choice. Excellent, all right, thanks Jeff. All right, round three. Wayne, this is an Omaha viewer. You have two pictures of this one. Uh, these insects were all over the stucco foundation wall during the evening. Not sure what they are. Are they good or are they bad? And these I think are... we have a second picture. Yep. Yeah. Yep. This is typical. Evening, you see your dog day cicadas. Your, there's what we typically call not your periodical ones. So uh, not this time of year. We're too late for that and wrong year. So this would be uh, one of those dog day cicadas that are coming up out of the ground after feeding on roots for anywhere from one to four years, and depending on species. And now they're out of that, it's gonna pop the cicadas. It sheds the last nymph exoskeleton. Okay, a good guy, sort of. All right, then your next one here is just, the question is, aren't these amazing? They were on the back porch wall. What is it? This is Hershey. This is a chickweed geometer. Okay, <laughs> here's a name for you. Yep, so they like to feed on chickweed. Uh, they'll also grow, uh, feed on things, the caterpillars will anyway, feed on knotweeds and some of the other low prostrate um, growing plants out there, including clovers. Excellent, you know, it's so. a good I like one. That. I want that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, don't squish it. And your next one here, uh, this is a papillion viewer, wanted to share this picture of a hummingbird moth that she saw on campus. Yeah, this particular one is a snowberry clear wing. It's one of our few day active moths. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another one called the hummingbird clear wing and you look at the legs. This one has black legs, so it's a snowberry clear wing. The other one has kind of a yellow to brown legs. Perfect, beautiful, beautiful. picture, very beautiful. Very awesome. All right, speaking of beautiful, this is a Lincoln viewer, Lauren, who found one tomato or no, this is your... One tomato. This yeah. is not a tomato. This is uh, something that they're wondering. What is the, what is this that they discovered? So this is at a more mature stage of uh, a polyporous sulfurous, which is a, a sulfur shelf mushroom, or also called chicken of the woods. Um, so you can look up more pictures of that online. Uh, it's not one to worry about being poisonous, but it does suggest that the tree... Uh, may be declining. So usually these grow around trees that are dying or in the process of. All right, and that's a Herman viewer, Herman mm -hmm. Nebraska. All right, now we have the tomato. Uh, this is a Lincoln viewer, found one in the garden. Seeds were saved from last mm -hmm. year. Uh, they think it's brown regrowth fruit virus. It, it is one of our fruit viruses and, and it's hard to tell. It does have rings on it. So there are some ring spot viruses that I would think it might be. Mm -hmm. um, saving seed is a great way to do this. So, um, I, in fact, you know, I, I save some seeds, so I get to see some of these beautiful things. <laughs> but if you don't want that, I'd really recommend getting new seed, unfortunately. All so. right. Your next one is also a tomato. This is mm -hmm. a Roma. And, of course, what's this? You know, I messed this up one time. Mm -hmm. This is Blossom End Rot. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 One of my first shows, I called this Botrytis Fruit Rot or something, and it was totally wrong. But <laughs> this is Blossom End Rot. Uh, usually related to uh, irregular watering. So another thing, you know, just like Jeff talked about with stress, you also get nutrient stress deficiency symptoms like this. So uh, mm -hmm. this is calcium deficiency, most likely due to uneven watering. All right, guess. your next one is a Sargent Nebraska viewer. What are these little white spots on the potatoes? I, I'm gonna be 100% honest. I looked quite a bit. I have no idea. I thought this was one of our fungi that forms a little sclerotia, but it, it, it just doesn't match up to me, so I, I'm, I'm gonna have to punt on this and you know, we may have to ask around and get back or if they have a sample, if they're more curious and they wanna send in because this one, I, I do not know. So. All right. that's, a, that's a potato you would peel before eating. Exactly. Yeah, you, you could really peel know. it and you would be okay. But no, there, there are some fungi that form these little fungal bodies that are more uniform, but that doesn't look like what they normally do. All right, so, and anyway, your final one sorry. is, this could be anybody who has peonies in Lincoln. They're mm -hmm. turning brown mm -hmm. every year like this, but then they, what, what is this and what can they do about it? So in this particular case, and I think in a lot of cases, um, there, there are fungal leaf spots that almost blight 
the whole plant. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Botrytis leaf blight, Botrytis gets into the, the petal and the, the flower also. So uh, I would just use some good sanitation at the end of the year. Uh, it's really too late to try to manage anything at this point. And then use sanitation, avoid overhead irrigation, and uh, hopefully they'll look better next year. All right, thanks, Lauren. Speaking of hydrangeas, you have two pictures here, Jeff. This is Annabelle not doing very well. Is it sun scorched? This is in Princeton. They're on the south side of the house under a couple large maples. Yeah, so I would say it's in the wrong side. It's a great plant. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have it on the south side. Lord made a very good point about heat and reflective heat. That was off a roof, this is off a brick. So that side of the house just is not cooling down at night either. Mm -hmm. uh, so it may do well in a, in a lawn area on the south side of the house where it's able to cool down at night, but mm -hmm. there, that, it's just cooking it all night, so. All right, and then we have two more pictures. This is uh, from Omaha. This is a little lime, mm -hmm. south side of the house, part shade. Uh, did really well for a month and then all of a sudden this happened. They don't see insects. They've sprayed with things even though they didn't see mm -hmm. anything. So what's the deal? Yeah, I think it's probably the same sort of issue. You know, and I think with some of these, what you want to look at, especially with new plants, is many times the planting mix that the shrub is mm -hmm. in is very light and you may be using the overhead sprinkler or something like that to water, uh, but the roots are in that very well-drained light soil and so it, it dries out just very quickly and you're ne never able to catch up. So I think with any of these, you wanna make sure that you have, you're putting it in good soil, you're checking the moisture when you're watering to make sure that you're getting that root zone wet. And so you're gonna have to get down there and stick your hand in there and make sure that it's actually getting wet. All right, and your final two pictures are Sugar Shack Buttonbush, which is also on the southwest corner of the house, very close to the house, uh, watered with uh, underground sprinklers every other day for 20 minutes. Yeah, and again, I mean, if the if the sprinklers are doing their job, uh, and that's kind of environmental when I see that from the outside in, that's telling me um, that's probably, it's not, the plant's not able to keep up with, with the heat and the dry. So your, your overhead sprinklers probably are not getting that wet enough. Right. So. Yeah, all right. Well, with all this hot weather we've been having, it might be difficult to think fall is right around the corner. But for our second feature tonight, Jeff gives us some good tips for your lawn, your shrubs, and your trees. Well, we're going into fall. Our mornings are a little cooler. I think we're all starting to get that sense that now's a good time to start looking at doing some planting around the house. Um, so a couple of things to keep in mind, if you're in an area that seems a little too warm, seems a little dry yet, maybe hold off a little bit on our planting for the fall. We still have some time. Uh, if you're in an area that you've had some timely rains and, and your temperatures are good, then you might want to consider a few things. We'll start first of all with our lawns. So this is a really good time to go in if you need to improve your lawn a little bit. Uh, you can do some aerating, uh, run that dethatcher. Uh, over your bluegrass or your fescue, your cool season lawns. You're, we're not gonna wanna do any buffalo grass seeding right now, no warm season grass, grasses, but we can look at our cool season grasses, our bluegrass and fescue. So with bluegrass, you're looking at maybe a pound to three pounds of seed per thousand square feet if you're doing some inner seeding. For fescue, more like five pounds per thousand square feet. Again, aerate, seed it, fertilize it, uh, it'll get, get you off to a good start. And that's something we're gonna wanna do here before the middle of September or so. Uh, bulbs is another thing that we can look at planting in the fall, our spring flowering bulbs. We're gonna wanna stay away from dahlias, gladiolas, that sort of thing, cannas. We don't wanna plant those this time of year, but uh, our alliums, or daffodils, uh, tulips, all those, this is a good time follow the instructions, they all have different depths. Make sure we do the, the pointy side up when we're planting our bulbs. Our shrubs, uh, this is also a good time to do that. Again, you know, we wanna be cognizant of what our weather conditions are and, and if it's too warm, too dry right now, you might wanna hold off and just see what the fall brings you. But talk to your nursery professional about what they have in stock that looks really good, nice healthy plants, uh, have them look at the root system for you. We, we want some shiny white roots in there so to make sure that we have something that's doing well. And then again, focusing on our planting holes. So we wanna make sure that we dig the hole really well. We're not putting it into something that's um, 
difficult for the roots to go into. So we, because the key right now is with the good temperatures uh, and some good moisture, hopefully, we're able to get some good root growth to help get them through the winter months. Uh, our trees uh, are another thing that we can look at planting, same sort of principles, good healthy plants, make sure that we're digging a good hole, uh, making sure that the roots have some place to go. Um, so that's something to look at. So some things to avoid with trees and shrubs. Some of our evergreens, we may want to put off until maybe next spring. If you can do it fairly soon, here before the 1st of October, so things like rhododendrons, boxwoods, uh, our evergreen trees need time to develop root systems. So that's something that we want to make sure we give them enough time. And then any of these plants, as we go through the winter months, we're going to want to periodically make sure we give them a drink of water. So if we have good snow cover, if the ground's frozen, you don't have to worry about it. But certainly in Nebraska lately, a lot of times the ground isn't freezing or it's kind of dry. So get yourself on a monthly watering schedule for any new landscape plants that we put out there. And again, make sure you focus on good, healthy plants and then monitoring those plants as we go through the winter months so we start off with a nice spring next year. I'm digging, okay. So we should have you covered for everything from turf to trees this fall. It's always a good idea to get out there and inspect those plantings, take notes, make plans for next season. Yeah. All right, so Wayne, what are these bugs on my zinnias? What is the best time to deal with them? She's using seven in spring just before dark not to kill the pollinators. This is from Lake Park, Iowa. I really would not be putting seven or carbaryl, that active ingredient, on a flower because uh, that's going to stay there and, and catch your pollinators even the next day. Um, probably the best thing for taking care of these on the flowers is just a bucket of soapy water where you're knocking them off into there. Those are northern corn rootworms. They're a native beetle, but they love pollen, so that's why they're there on the flower. All right, thank you. Your next one is, uh, this is from Omaha, and she's saying, what kind of spider is this, and are the tiny round objects clustered together on the egg case baby spiders? I think she sent two pictures on this one. It's, it's one of our either cobweb or, or weaver spiders. It's really tough to tell from this picture. The spider just isn't quite in focus enough to tell. And then, yeah, that egg sack is hatching. That's what all those little extra little dots are. So all those little spiderlings are hanging out. <laughs> cool. All right. So your next one here, this is Loop City. And uh, they want to know what kind of spider this is. This is a white banded crab spider. The coloration on these can be highly variable, all the way from that yellow to white in coloration, and those dark bands can be variable as well. The only way you can really tell, if you look down at the face, right underneath the eyes, there's this little swooping white to yellow mustache marking right on a ridge line. That's how you tell the difference on this one. And crab spiders are good guys, yes? Yes and no. They're equal opportunity hunters at flowers. Okay. So they Excellent. can hit your pollinators too. All right. Thank you, Wayne. All right, Lauren. Uh, this is an Omaha viewer that says all of a sudden the leaves on a bunch of the pepper plants look like this and on some tomatoes as well. Happened really fast. I think he has a picture of the tomato and the pepper kind of together in that location also. Yeah, so the, the challenge here is when I see leaf drop at the lower portion of the plant, I, I tend to think foliar disease, but I don't see symptoms on there. So I'm wondering if this isn't a response to the high temperatures that did this and maybe it looks like they have a, a, a soaker hose system set up, which is perfect, but just make sure you have adequate moisture. Uh, but I don't see anything I'm worried about managing but it didn't look like there was a lot of fruit on either in the picture, so I, it made me question water availability. All right, and heat, of course, with fruit mm -hmm. set. That's mm -hmm. kind of an issue, too. Yeah. All right, your next one, um, this is south of Gibbon. She calls this little creepy stuff <laughs> in the mulch. She has two oh. pictures here, and they're really great pictures. Look at those oh, pictures. Oh, that's beautiful. So if you think about how you would describe this, we can almost be an entomologist in this spike because so many times it's the yellow banded spider if it has yellow bands or it's on a squash <laughs> plant it's a squash fruit bug or whatever this is a bird nest fungus mm -hmm. so it's just a beautiful little thing that looks like a bird nest and those are the perennials of the fungus that are how it spreads so those little bodies inside are like seeds so if you want to see this in more places you could dump those out and you could go sprinkle them around in your mulch bed and you can have them all over and it'd be beautiful so those are the little fungal eggs yeah they're like little fungal eggs yeah okay beautiful Perfect. thank you lauren awesome great picture 
All right, your first three pictures, Jeff, on this one are from an Omaha viewer. It's an Althea shrub, uh, b big shrub, mm -hmm. and uh, struggled for the last two years to produce flowers, produces lots of buds, very few flowers. They fertilize it in the spring, but they want to know how to get those buds to actually flower. You know, it's really tough, and this is a common problem with Rosa Sharon. So mm -hmm. they, they produce a lot of buds, um, overproduced the amount of buds, which limits their flowering. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things you could look at, you could try, I guess, again, all the things we've talked about, the cultural things, water, mulch, blah, blah, but it looks like we have that stuff covered here. Maybe looking at some mid-season pruning to thin that a little bit so we kind of uh, eliminate some of the prolific flowering going on. That might help, but it's a, it's a common problem. It's not really known why it's an issue for some Rosa Sharon's, and your neighbor may have the same one, it's just covered in flowers. So right. sometimes it's just kind of hard to explain. There's no real biological reason why it's happening. All right, and your next one is, same thing, Fremont uh, gets lots of flowers, but they dry up and die. Mm -hmm. So this is a newer shrub though. Yeah, that is a newer shrub. Yeah, so again, just double check, make sure that you're getting, because it's newer, make sure that we are having good even moisture. It's a new plant, I wouldn't sweat it yet. But again, that's kind of a, that's one of the reasons why maybe Rosa Sharon is not always one of our favorite plants. All right, and quickly on this last one, what's going on with this uh, wing euonymus? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, to me, I'm almost starting to wonder if it's a pathology issue, if we have a sort of disease going on in there, uh, herbicide damage. I mean, when you see kind of this yellowing, multicolored leaves and distorted growth. Yeah. Um, sample is good. Yeah, sample would be good in this case.